Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today in the temple, it's situation normal in the sense that Jesus is surrounded by his antagonists and they are waiting with bated breath to catch him in something that will get him into trouble. Now, this is a perfect setup because Jesus is always given to some provocation, which is one of the reasons I like him so much. I mean, apart from being the son of God and what Jesus has just said is really a remarkable statement. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And what the Jews demand of Jesus is that he tell them plainly that he is the Christ. So he gives them just enough rope with which to hang himself. But really what Jesus has done is he could not speak any clearer because Jesus is speaking in the language of the prophets. It's through the prophet Ezekiel that God has said, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. But the shepherd that God is sending is not just another successor to David's throne. He's not simply another one in that long line of under shepherds that God had sent to guide his people in the truth. Because what God will say through the prophet Ezekiel is that he will come and be the shepherd. God says, behold, I, I myself will search out for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And so the shepherd who is coming, the true David, is God himself. He is the ultimate shepherd. This is why Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. Because no one is good but God alone. And so when he says to them, I am the good shepherd, what he means could not be any more clear. And yet they say, well, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, then tell us plainly. What else could he mean? How else is he supposed to say it? Jesus anticipates the life of the ministry a lot. I do have to tell you. It's like, how many different times do I have to say it? And so what he says is, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. And why is it that some people simply don't recognize the voice of the good shepherd when he comes into their midst? This is a question that we actually make unnecessarily complicated. We want to know this sometimes. Why is it that people don't believe in Jesus? We make these things complicated. And Jesus actually gives us a very simple answer today. Because it is not for many of the reasons that we bandy about in church life. It's not because people lack sufficient evidence concerning who Jesus is. It's not an intellectual problem. It's an ego problem sometimes, but it's not an intellectual problem. And the Pharisees have all the proof that they want. And Jesus says, you don't believe even though you've seen my works and my works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. It is not an evidentiary problem. It's also not because the church cannot find a sexy way to market the gospel in a consumerist society. People aren't impressed by that stuff, okay? That's not the problem. And it's not because people simply haven't made a conscious decision to believe in Jesus. It's also not because God doesn't want them to be his sheep. We heard in our reading from Revelation that he is gathering together peoples from every nation, from all tribes and languages and people. Jesus says further in John chapter 10, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. You see, it's not just the lost sheep of the house of Israel that Jesus wants, but he wants all kinds of sheep. 
He wants Gentile sheep like you. He wants black sheep and white sheep and speckled sheep and red and yellow sheep and all the other kind of sheep. Every tribe and language and tongue and nation. It still doesn't answer the question, though. Why is it that not everyone is a sheep in Christ's flock? And maybe there's a better question to ask. The better question is, what is it that makes you a sheep in Christ's flock? And again, Jesus answers this very simply. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Everyone else, it seems, does not do a whole lot of listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd. What they do instead is they talk. And they talk and they drown out the voice of the shepherd. And what they typically tend to say is, I don't want to be a sheep. I don't blame them. Do you want to be completely, utterly dependent on anybody else? Do you want to be completely helpless? I don't think so. What we rather like to do instead is we like to pick and choose what we want to believe. Like God's word is one big cafeteria. It's like the guy with the crown, you know, he says, have it your way. This is how people treat God's word. It's the polar opposite of what St. Paul says in our reading from Acts. When he speaks to the pastors in Ephesus and he says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. That's what God's word is. It's his whole counsel. It is not something to pick and to choose. And so we fight against that temptation to buck against the whole counsel of God. And sometimes what we do is we like to portray ourselves as if we're on some sort of heroic quest for the truth. I'm just too humble to say I know what's right. So I just keep on. And see, this is very convenient for us. Because then, when our circumstances change, we're able to change what we believe to fit what we want. Because nobody wants to be a sheep. And yet, we all are. We say other things. I'm a self-made man. I'm an independent woman. I'm the captain of my fate. I'm the master of my soul. It's all lies. And the Jews certainly don't want to be anybody's sheep. And so this is why they want to catch Jesus in some sort of perceived blasphemy so that they can get rid of him. But in the meantime, they can pick apart what he says and find some kind of principled reason to reject him, and then they can kill him. They want to be the arbiters of the truth. And even as the church bears faithful witness to who Jesus is and what he has done, we do eventually have to come to grips with something. And that is that some people just don't get it. And that's the reality. But Jesus also says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And those who follow his voice recognize the mouth of Jesus as the mouth of God. And they also recognize this much about themselves. They know that they're sheep. You see, everyone is a sheep of some variety. Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. And the truth is, is that nobody is above influence. Nobody is immune to the forces that shape our reality. Whether it's the media or the government or the medical complex. Ideology. It's really just a matter of whose voice you believe. And you who have heard the voice of Christ, the Good Shepherd, you didn't choose it. You didn't choose to be a part of his flock any more than you chose to be conceived and born. I don't think anybody gave you that option. And this is how it is then. I mean, it's true of so many things that our identity is given to us. Your cultural identity, ethnic identity, your national identity, and God knows that you give your children your sports identity. You know, I'm not a sports person, but you know, I always dress up the babies like in the little jerseys and stuff. Um, you know, there's some religious devotion there, I would say. Have you ever thought about 
Just think about it, especially on Mother's Day. One of the tragedies of Mother's Day is that not every mother was what she ought to have been. And yet, we can be thankful for the mothers that we have. My mom is here today, by the way. And my mom raised me in church. You see where I ended up? Where do you think Thomas is going to end up? But you see how many things, these things are given to us. Now imagine a parent raising a child and saying, well, you know, you don't have to be an American if you don't want to. One day you can renounce your citizenship. You can do whatever. Most people don't leave the country to do that, but you know what I mean. You can go ahead and renounce your American identity, renounce your citizenship. You know how bizarre and ridiculous that would be? Why is it that children are raised to believe that what happens here is unimportant? Decide it for yourself. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to go when you're 18. Bizarre. It's evil. Our citizenship is greater in the kingdom of heaven. And this is something that is given to us. And this is how Jesus answers that question. That when Jesus, when he's speaking about how he calls by his voice, how he calls as the good shepherd, you think about your own life. Why was it that I plodded along from the font kind of haphazardly? I'm going to enjoy watching that video, by the way. I thought that was great. I plodded along from the font, and then I went to Sunday school, and I went to confirmation, and then I eventually I made it to the altar, and here I am today. Why did you always know the voice of the Good Shepherd? And Jesus says, very simply, my Father has given them to me. This is a divine and sacred mystery that we've stumbled upon. It is not something that you can rationalize. It's something that we simply adore. That everything that we have is a gift. And that gift is given to you in the waters of holy baptism. As we've seen with little Gloria Maria today. That the good shepherd comes and he lays down his life for the sheep. And then in his own good time, he calls us by his own means, by his voice in order that we would trust in him. And it's rather undramatic, actually, a lot of the time. Babies have been on my mind, as you could imagine. And you know, King David, he says in the 22nd Psalm that you, God, made me trust you at my mother's breast. That's why children come to church, by the way. And then when John the Baptist is in utero, he leaps for joy in the presence of an unborn baby. As Jesus our Lord, when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, and John is the first person in the gospel to recognize Jesus as his Savior, and he is a fetus. And I don't want to speak too soon, but thanks be to God that it might just be that in this country, many more children will have the opportunity to leap for joy in Jesus' presence. But of those sheep, Jesus says this, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. And you were delivered into the Father's hand in the waters of the Good Shepherd's Baptism. That's where he called you by name. He made you his child. And there is no more powerful, visible sign of God's grace to us than the baptism of a child. You really get the picture that it is entirely by God's grace, entirely apart from ourselves, what we think, what we will, what we do. You see that in the baptism of a child with little Gloria. <coughs> Everything is a gift. And those gifts are never taken away from us because the one who gives them, he tells us, he's one with the Father. The Father is the giver of every good gift and every perfect gift. 
He brought us forth not by our will, but by His own will. By the word of His truth. That's what St. James says. It's all grace. It's all pure gift. And so may our Heavenly Father and the Good Shepherd that He has appointed by the power of His Holy Spirit keep us as His own until that time that we finally see the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd was wakened from death as you and I will be. And when we finally see Him, then we will ever extol Him by proclaiming, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.